Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to live in the mystery, more connected to nature and to spirit, then do we have the Expect Great Things show for you. Today I'll be talking with Kevin Dan, naturalist, historian, biographer, and the author of an utterly astonishing book on Henry David Thoreau, Expect Great Things. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about the mystic, the spiritual seeker, and the transcendental naturalist, Henry David Thoreau. That, plus we'll talk about playing Tom Fool, Tahatawan and Arrowheads, Harvard and Fairies, The Importance of Robin Goodfellow, Going a-Graping, The Power of Kayaks, and What in the World Walking 235 Miles and Roving Huckleberry Parties Have to Do with Anything. Oh, I can't wait. Gotcha. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the show, Kevin. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine, Michael. Thank you. Woohoo! I told you we were going to have some fun today. Bravo. It, it's been a while, but I, I just have to cut you off and tell you that is the most glorious, most playful, most thoroughworthy uh, introduction that I've experienced over the course of this year with this uh, this book and carrying this story. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Oh, and, and that makes my day. And, and, and even putting me in the same universe of Thoreau is is the hugest compliment. So thank you so much. <laughs> it is uh, it is my job when I start an interview, first off, I want to help you to feel comfortable. And and no matter what happens, like the technical challenges we had off air, I want to make you feel comfortable. If I can share with you that I've actually read your book, understand something of it, and can develop that heartfelt connection then no matter what, we're going to have a great interview. It's a, it's a deep, deep, deep honoring that one gets to do when one is invited to write a biography or has the opportunity to write a biography. And uh, I guess the closest reciprocal honoring that could be done is, as an author is to meet a reader uh, who has has brought their whole their, their whole self to it, and clearly, Michael, we haven't even, you haven't even asked me the first question, and I can see that you've done that. So what what a delight, what a delight. Well, thank you, and and it goes both ways, and and we'll we'll dive into this. I want to double back onto this Dobro in just a minute, though. But this book is is phenomenal, and it introduced a side of Thoreau. I think you mentioned, if I understood correctly, that you you read Walden Pond seven times. That you have to peel away layer after layer. Maybe it's maybe it's infinitely more than that at this point. Thoreau, oh, oh, go ahead. You know, they always everybody in Concord thought that the pond the pond didn't have a bottom. Uh, certainly, this book doesn't have a bottom. That's that's absolutely true. The book doesn't have a bottom, and the biography doesn't have a bottom, because the more that you read, the more that you begin to understand, the more that you begin to ask questions, and the more you want to go back and reread. He was a riddle. I've got an image up of the sunset here, but what I find fascinating is it's over Walden Pond. One side of me is illuminated. The other side of me is dark. And, and Thoreau was clearly a riddle within an enigma. Yes. and. And he liked it that way. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you first become interested in Henry David Thoreau, who I didn't know was actually David Henry Thoreau? Well, uh, Michael, back when I was in high school, it was pretty much in the canon for, I think, probably junior year of high school English that you read Walden. Uh, you know, we didn't just have a paragraph about the transcendentalists in our textbooks. We we had the good fortune to actually read the text. And uh, I had a long haired uh, hippie, Jim Mura as my, uh, my high school English teacher, who was a guy, you know, teaching in suburban New Jersey, but you could tell, you know, if he followed his heart, he would have been out on a pond someplace. Mm -hmm. But, um, and uh, yeah, so we had, we had a wonderful opportunity to, to read that book together. And it, it just, it totally, you know, I, 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 I essentially looking back on it now, I realize how most of my early uh, adult life was spent trying to live a kind of Thoreauian existence in the 
in the late 20th century, like so many other people in my generation, I think. When i looking at just, I just briefly looked at a biography of all the books you've written, and I can see a thread going through here. What was your connection to nature, to the natural world in your early years like? Yeah, well, so as I said, I grew up in suburban Jersey, but just just kind of on the edge of, uh, of a, a mountain range called the Rampo Mountains, which are the front range of the, of the Appalachians. So, and I grew up on a brook. I grew up on a brook with a pond nearby. And as, as you know, you know, all that a kid needs is uh, a lot, an empty lot, to, to be drawn into uh, the beauty of the earth. So we had, as, as kids, you know, we spent all of our spare time catching stuff, you know, crayfish, frogs, turtles. We always had uh, a whole menagerie out in the backyard. And, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, I think back on it and I think everybody in my neighborhood was a naturalist mm -hmm. then. You know, we all, uh, the boys, I, I, I have to say, speak for the boys. I, I, I don't think we let the girls come along with us and they weren't that interested, but, uh, yeah, we were always up to our knees in muck and uh, catching baby snappers and trying to see, uh, you know, who could catch the biggest this and catch the biggest that. And um, so that by the time in high school, when unfortunately in this, I think in our culture, a lot of us then turn our back on the wonders of the natural world and are drawn in, you know, adolescence is a is a time of a different kind of questing, um, you know, we lose, we lose that. But if, I think, I think that book was so important to me because I continue to seek out the places where I plunk myself down to do my questing. There was always a kind of a sense that, that Thoreau communicates in Walden, which is that you can do this exploration wherever you are. You can go on these most wonderful adventures and, uh, yeah, so I, I really, I think that growing up in New Jersey, which at the time the joke was what exit, um, uh, you know, I'm a good example of the fact that a, a suburban uh, youth offers plenty of, of avenues and opportunities for exploration. Thank you. So, so we, some synchronicity here. We came back, my wife had gotten very sick. I mentioned that off air. We'd lived in, in Maui for a few years. We came back to New Jersey, just outside Morristown for her to heal. And what I discovered, the running joke was, I'm going anywhere but New Jersey. Take me anywhere but New Jersey, because I knew of it from the highway and my grandparents after you, they lived past all the refineries and stuff. Mm. And what I found Ramapo State, Forest State Park, Ringwood, all these areas going up to uh, Greenwood Lake right on the border of New York, I found incredible nature in my backyard and I learned a very important nature lesson that if you look for it, nature is all around us. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful just to hear you use those place names, Michael. Um, you know, I always quote this terrible uh, kind of Hallmark cards uh, expression. We we love best with those hills we know first, and it's really true. Everything just becomes, and and uh, you know that's something that uh, you know Thoreau didn't. He barely went away from the place where he was born, and uh, so he had that parochialism, that localism was something that he chose explicitly at a time when you know that was not a an uncommon thing, but for, for us modern, uh, who are much more cosmopolitan, uh, the fact is that, yeah, those, those early years are just so formative. And I, I went, you know, I lived in Vermont for 30 years and, but then I did my, my graduate study in New Jersey. And part of the reason I chose to do it in New Jersey was I actually got the chance to, every time I commuted back and forth, I would go up in the ramp post to have Harriman State Park. And I'd go on long walks, you know, I'd go on three day ridgeline walks mm -hmm. uh, every spring and um, to kind of keep that connection because there is something that was in, you know, that I had this sense that the land saw me when I would go back in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s. I always had this sense that I wasn't just seeing my favorite trees, my, my favorite little cove 
my favorite, uh, the smell of a particular brook. But I always had this sense that I was being recognized. And um, right now, as I say that, I have goose flesh from head to toe. Me and I too. think in some way, having the opportunity to write this biography, let me actually connect with the reality of what that inchoate sense was, that there was actually a spiritual, a real spiritual experience and real spiritual beings behind that sense of being seen that I only came to understand a little more fully many, many years later. The expression that comes to mind, and it was something I mentioned to you briefly earlier, is know thy land. To me, mm -hmm. if you know your land, and we are the land wherever we're at, but if we know the land, and by know the land, know it through the seasons, know it as the changes occur, like like uh, Thoreau talking about there's a, uh, not a locust, um, what do you call it, the summer, the uh, cricket that starts going, locusts. Now, there's a locust season, and and if you know the land and know the seasons, and are there grounded with the land, you know a bit more about yourself. Oh, amen and hallelujah to that, definitely. So, when you're running around, the areas that are your stomping ground, they seem very, I think every area is spiritual. Every area has an energy to it. But the area you're talking about specifically, to me, has a very strong Native American feeling to it. Well, that's, I fell in love with, I would think I was in uh, sixth grade and I had gotten interested in, in Indians. You know, I started thinking, I'm finding out that these names of all these places, Mawa, the town that I grew up next to, the Rampo River, which was my Hohokus Brook ran into the Rampo River. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just such marvelous musical words. And I remember going to my sixth grade teacher and saying, I, I want to learn about the Indians, you know? Um, and I can see in my mind's eye, I can see the little elementary school library and the librarian taking me over to this one lower bookshelf and pulling out a book and putting it in my hands. And it was a book called Dickin Among the Lenape, Rutgers University Press. Yeah. Uh, John Harrington, who was a great ethnologist, uh, who wrote a fictional account of a boy about my age, or probably a little bit older, maybe 12 years old, who shipwrecked, an English boy shipwrecked in the Delaware Bay, who's adopted, uh, found and adopted by a Lenape uh, family. And uh, Harrington has had a great facility for sketching. So it was basically like a, a Boy Scout manual or a, um, uh, you know, an old woodcraft manual put into a story about a boy. It was like the ultimate way to time travel back to the 17th century at the time of English uh, native contact. And yeah, that sent me into the woods, of course, with new eyes and new appreciation and, and basically a lot of ghosts, you know, as soon as you, as soon as you've gone there in your mind, then it doesn't matter that it's 400 years later, they're there, you know? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, oh, you say ghost, I, I camped out once, um, at, at my in-laws place in a tent at night. And I had just a, I, I took my cat, Sir Meowser, a very grounded, very self-assured cat. And we went into this tent and in the middle of the night, he freaked out and needed back in the house. And I soon after freaked out. And then I ended up doing research on the area and a big slaughter that had taken place there. Um, yeah. Oh, well, there was such a place right nearby, uh, where Henry grew up as well. And, and, you know, I, I think if I were to, you know, what the touchstone for me of, uh, that exists in, in my, my biography, uh, expect great things was I pretty much committed at the beginning. I just thought, I'm just going to commit to reading every word of the journals. Yes. And there it was, you know, in about 20 pages into the journals was that story that he tells. And yeah, I mean, we, I, there's the goose flesh again. The fact is that he's haunted by this experience of having with his beloved brother, John conjured forth those ghosts of, of the people of his, of his region there. And, um, and they are alive. And 
there there he actually gets a response that whole sense of that you're recognized and that the the land is listening and is going to give itself to you he had that experience of the that out of nowhere out of thin air there's that arrowhead you know as if just from the hand of the maker right yeah um so anyway we're both nodding we know um, <laughs> but yeah that just for your audience to to say that in the very beginning of his uh, of his journal really the first story he tells is the story of says you know about six weeks ago this strange thing happened and he was out uh with john and they were hunting for arrowheads and and uh telling stories and in a, a moment of bravado henry says you know there stood tatown's hut and here is tatown's arrowhead and he reaches down to the ground and he picks up you know a stone and it's an arrowhead and he knows that he's been given it but he doesn't know how the heck it happened um and he's he's really mystified here's this man who's the ultimate observer the keenest of observers and he cannot he cannot figure out how it was that he literally wished for something and it was given to him and that becomes that becomes his motto in his life expecting great things in the long run we find what we expect we shall be fortunate then if we expect great things i think that's exactly the it sounds from our brief conversation before we began that's exactly what you're conjuring for your community if i may say so uh, that's that's my whole goal so you hit the nail on the head absolutely <laughs> what fascinates me about this too is if you you think of him as a naturalist, but if you don't really dive into him and you don't think of his backstory, you may think of of his Harvard education. You may think of him as somebody who is um, more, <laughs> we say, in this world than of this world. But when you dive into it, if that's the right way to put it, we can go back to, for instance, his Harvard years. We can go way on back. But this is a time period where it's still okay even if people are starting to poo-poo it, to talk about our spiritual connection or to talk about fairies even. Yes. Uh, it's, it's a, and, and Concord, I think, is a perfect laboratory to understand this, a place far enough from the metropolitan to have folkways, really deep folkways, mm -hmm. and to have a, a heterogeneous enough population people of all sorts of backgrounds, but people very close to the land, um, as well as very learned. And it, it's already becoming an intentional community of people of very, very high ideals and extraordinary education, but who appreciate folk wisdom and wit. Nobody as much as Henry did. Um, and so it's a perfect middle ground, you know, it's a perfect kind of liminal place where he can summon, he can go deeply into, with this question, and he can read all of Shakespeare's works and, and bring forth uh, these images and compare them alongside his own experience, listen to his neighbors, and, but also <laughs> somehow, I think not out of shame, not out of embarrassment, but out of an intuition that all the folk wisdom is true spiritual experiences are absolutely so sacred and so intimate that one one has to cultivate an inner relationship that's strong with them that's so much stronger than any kind of outer discourse mm. and so he somehow intuited uh from his own experience that uh all of this wisdom was correct. Don't talk about the beings. Just love them. Just listen to them. Just be with them. And and the, in deepening that relationship, uh, you know, it, it affirmed what he already knew. I think. And and so, I, you know, as you as you may or may not know, um, it's it it. Or maybe it became the most important thing for me to say in in my sharing his story was to say 
this was a real experience for him. Mm. And isn't it funny that the man that we hold up as a paragon of intimacy with the land, with the natural world, wouldn't it be so that he would cross that barrier from the physical world that out of his love and devotion and his honoring and his exploration, his interest, just his keen interest, that the beings would come to meet him and be with him. And that's my sense. And in a way, I violated a confidence. You know, I made a discovery. I think I made a discovery, but nobody wanted to hear about it. Uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal, the headline of the review was Thoreau believed in fairies. Uh, the New York Times, you know, review uh, dismissed. Yeah, it might be, you know, this might be some good things in this book, but this new age hokum about Thoreau uh, having an experience of the elemental world, they that this is how far we've fallen from Thoreau's time, that he was just on the cusp where he could at least intimately in in a hidden way share uh share a little bit of those experiences um and now we dismiss we would dismiss him out of hand forgive that long-winded uh no it was there. beautiful it was it was beautiful and there's so many directions i want to go we as a collective as a society we're lost right now we get to find our way back we couldn't be separated. I remember going through New York City a few years back, and I looked up at this bird that really didn't seem to belong in the city. I don't remember if it was an eagle or a hawk. It was this magnificent bird in this tree. And I look up and I go, ah. and the guy is, a guy is walking past me with his briefcase. He may or may not have had a Starbucks cup in his hand. I can't recall. And he, and he goes, nature, I don't do nature. Oh, my. When you spend time out there, when you really spend time with nature, which is spending time with yourself, the voices come back. The connection comes back. There is no way for it not to. That's one of the reasons this book is so important to me and I think is so important for all of us. It reminds us of who we are, but it's not coming from a voice that we would typically discount. It's coming from a voice that's taught in the modern classroom, a voice that we are taught to look up to. And yet, if you dig beneath the surface, there he is, dancing with spirit, dancing with nature, dancing with all that there is that we say is no longer. Oh, thank you for using the image of dancing because that boy could dance. You know, his life was a dance. And indeed, uh, it's such a tragedy. If I, if I could transport myself back to 1973 and that high school classroom, mm -hmm. that probably, to, probably it was difficult even for my, uh, my hip, Mr. Mira, to talk about transcendentalism, mm -hmm. you know, the very, the very concept was in, in, in its essence is there's more than the physical world. Right. And, uh, and that just was not, it, well, in polite adult conversation, that was not the thing that anybody was, was keen to, uh, enter into. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's it's just such a deep irony and so completely i think symptomatic of where we are that the this group of people who found each other and really did find each other because they didn't grow up together they i mean they they migrated to a, a specific place can can to, you share names such as emerson yeah so yeah that emerson uh wasn't fr from their uh um you know uh Bronson Alcott wasn't from there. Uh, um, that there is a there is just such a strange, strange thing that the more we it's true in history that we you know we have a distanced understanding of of people, but because this group 
holds such an important place as a as a pioneer indigenous spiritual impulse, mm -hmm. a really really strong one that was uh, that had purchase then and it has purchase for us still today. It gives us hope to feel that something you know we came here we came to we're in this this blessed cursed monstrous place called America, and that that uh, a group of people found each other and made um, a real effort to honor the invisible. Uh, and that we, across time, the at moment we pick up any of their works and study their biographies and, and, and read their works, we're, we're honoring them. We're entering into a communion with them, just as I think Thoreau and his circle believe when they read the classics, when they read Homer, they were in a, a spiritual communion with those with those individuals. They drew strength from it. It's what gave them their power to speak the way they did, and Emerson is, as well. So. Um, it's a, it's, it's an odd thing. I don't know. I, I don't know how, um, where, well, I, I think what I, what I did know is I was teaching college history and I, I had the experience that when I would uh, get to a place where I could interject into a world history curriculum, a bit of Thoreau and have them read a little bit of Thoreau, um, they didn't have any acquaintance with them. They weren't reading they hadn't been reading Walden in, in high school anymore for quite a little while. And and uh, and what everyone had was this caricature of uh, that. I also found when I when I went to Walden Pond and, and looked at the, the guest book in the reconstructed cabin there. And it was this horrific caricature of, oh, he wasn't really a hermit. His mother used to do his laundry and he'd go he'd go back home and eat his mother's food and um, and as if he were some kind of that he that this that, that this entire project for two years of living at Walden Pond was a wilderness camping trip, which, of course, had nothing to do with that. Mm. It, it was an experiment in cultivating his inner world as a as something fit to meet the outer world. And um, so we have a caricature that's a foot in the culture now. And um, at 200 years after his birth, to, you know, to take uh, a, a journey into his, into his soul via, via his very beautiful and intimate two million world, world journal, it was an extraordinary um, journey for me. What would you say is the Hmm. You were asking me about it earlier with the show, so we'll go there. What is your overarching mission, and what was your goal with the book? Well, it. I think I wanted to understand. I wanted wanted to understand. Uh, was what he brought to his encounter with the natural world. Was it unique? Was it something that was passed on to him? And then did it did it survive him? You know, I, I had my own uh, upbringing because after after high school, I studied uh, biology and environmental studies. I became a naturalist. I you know I worked for the Audubon Society, but none of it felt really like it was in the tradition of Henry David Thoreau. Um, so. I guess the first thing I wanted was to have a sense of just what was his method? What was his method? Um, and after understanding that method, uh, to celebrate the parts of it that felt to me that would be healing and inspirational for our contemporary world. There's not a part of his life that doesn't feel that it's a, a deep lesson for our our contemporary world. In fact, every day that goes by, uh, it seems more and more relevant and, and and more and more inspirational and harder and harder to slip into. What I slipped into, and, you, and maybe you did, uh, being you know a dozen or more years my junior, as young people growing up, just because we're kids, we have the great luxury of meeting the natural world on its own terms, mm -hmm. that's really not available to kids anymore. 
It's really not. Even kids in rural areas, not just the suburbs or urban areas, it has been completely taken away from children. And it's the deepest tragedy that uh, I can think of. And uh, I never, never would have imagined as in my 20s or my 30s or, or even even part of the time I was writing this book um, that that's where we would be. And so that's that's, I guess, what I and then, you know, I instead of doing a book tour, I walked from Manhattan up to Concord and uh, basically it became a game. What I really wanted to do was play. I thought dance and sing and play in, in the spirit of Henry. And so that's what I did. I, I sang his favorite song, Tom Bowling. But I basically distilled it down to one thing, which was to riddle to the people because he was a riddle, as you said, an enigma and a mystery. He also Instead of being didactic. Let it be as I'm being didactic mm -hmm. right now. Let it be a song. Let it be a dance. Let it be a riddle. Okay. Riddle is very close. And I don't know the origin, but it's very close to the word rhythm. And there mm. is a cadence that everything he uses. And I'm sure he would argue and agree that um, words have a frequency to them. And when you are, get that cadence going, you are in rhythm, you are in attunement, you are in accord with something oh, greater than yourself. Bless, bless you, Michael. Uh, Henry was all rhythm. He's all rhythm. And his method was essentially rhythm. That's, and I've, if I, I failed deeply in that my original intention was to catch as best as I could the rhythms in his life. Uh, but if you go and you read any of his work and you see this incantatory way that he can write, uh, not in the way that all of us know when we're speaking or writing, we can, we can catch our own jive and, and kind of feel, oh, fun. It's not that, it's not a self-satisfied, it's he, he's matching his rhythms uh, to something really profound. Uh, yeah. And you know, that, that uh, expression that, that I believe Emerson had, which was that Thoreau was the only person he knew who talked as he thought. Um, that, that's quite a thing. If you, if you think that this man actually would hold forth in a parlor, you know, not, much, not, not even a lecture hall, but just out in the field and forest on a walk mm -hmm. or uh, going down to the, the dry goods store, that pearls of wisdom would just roll from him that were fun and funny and, and riddling, uh, that, that is, that is quite a thing. Um, uh, I, I, I long to, uh, to, for a time in America when our discourse is so rhythmic and so playful that Henry would feel at home in it. Woohoo! <laughs> I love that you've been using the word fun and playful because today people say you have to get serious. You have to get serious about life. And he was about, in his words, the tomfoolery, the pure childlike joy and giddy fun of life. Yeah. I, and not, you know, we have to be careful because we do have a, a juvenilization, a kind of dumbing down mm -hmm. of so much of our, our civilization at this moment. Uh, but deep play, mm -hmm. there's nothing more intelligent. There's nothing that, that requires uh, a greater summoning of all your forces than than deep play, and especially when it's play with the wisdom that lives in the in the natural world, uh, it's his playfulness, I think, that let him cross the threshold. It's the yeah. the the elemental beings, the 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 fairies, if you will, the the good the good people. Uh, the the uh, we folk, Robin Goodfellow, they do not cross the threshold and enter into 
uh, playful communication with you unless you're going to play. They, they, they're, they're not, they're not coming in, um, uh, to have, to meet a furrowed brow. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, by their fruits, you shall know them. Uh, this, this playfulness, uh, is a, is a kind of a creativity. The, the wisdom that lives in the natural world is inherently playful and creative. And it, it's a kind of a resonance, you know, talking about rhythms. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's the deepest principle of white magic, like, and like, like conjures up like there's, there is something in that, that we need to know that all of our, uh, all of our gestures, that our gestures are calling forth something from, from the earth. Our, our, our words are the most, uh, powerful gesture mm -hmm. it's the what the ma the mages the, the magicians the uh the the shamans have always used but i think thoreau he he actually understood that the way he walked and the way he talked brought forth a response and uh and we need to know that too that hasn't changed in 150 200 years it's still it's still a, a, a eternal law it's something when I when I coach people and do law of attraction or whatever we want to call it of expecting great things, while the word is important and the word is incredibly important, what's much more important than that is the energy that's behind it. And when he's dancing, when it, when he walks, when he's playing with nature, it is all about the energy. Yeah, and and so whether it be a rare flower. The pink, the pinkster flower, the azalea bush. His thoughts brought brought discoveries to him, because the the quality of his thoughts was so refined, mm -hmm. and he didn't. In my life, I'm a blabbermouth. I typically find that when magic happens, it's when I storytell. When I go out and I I say something that isn't quite. When I I exaggerate it. And I act as if it's going to happen, and it happens. Bingo. Well, I think Henry, he had a much more beautiful inward way, which was he just had these this lived a, a kind of this pure yoga of he had this inner hygiene which acted. He didn't need to blabber ever. <laughs> he didn't need to blurt by his by his own inner gestures. It drew. It drew the good towards him. It drew the beautiful towards him. It drew the truth towards him. Uh, and think of it, 44 years old, 44 years old. And uh, when he passed from this world, that he'd gotten all that wisdom so, so young and, and enacted the wisdom. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a marvel. It's a marvel. Uh, How did the title of the book come about? Yeah, uh, you know, you go you go through a journal, and you're reading and you're reading and and just you begin to see patterns and and it seemed to me that you know the the the, the primary experience I wanted to have of him was how does he meet the world? How does the world meet him? And over and over again. There was the, the the same gesture that was in that first story he told, which was, I thought about something, held it very, very close to my heart, and lo and behold, presto, there, there it was. And that he continued to celebrate it, but simultaneously be mystified by it. Uh, and then he said it half a dozen ways. In the long run, we find what we expect. We shall be fortunate then if we expect great things. And you know, a, a one line expression like that, that one holds close to their heart, 
can do so much. Somehow he hadn't been given that because here's here's a little story for you. Um, I was invited to give uh, a commencement address mm -hmm. at a at a high school up in up in the Rampos, and the the teacher had read another book that I'd written and invited me to take, and it was about that area, and invited me to take these students um, on a on a hiking expedition. And so I took them to my favorite uh, ridge top shelter that I'd gone to since I was a boy. Yeah. And we did a silent walk in. I had just come back from a uh, three week pilgrimage in Europe. And we walked in, I think I, I set an intention before we made the walk. And we went up uh, to this ridge top mm -hmm. And then I said a little prayer and then we broke for lunch and we just begun to eat our lunch and a couple of kids yelled, Mr. Dan, Mr. Dan, I'm over here. And it was this six foot long rattlesnake. Now I've been to this place, Michael, probably three dozen, four dozen times in my life. And I'd never seen a rattlesnake up there. And so the whole, and it turned out none of the kids had ever seen a rattlesnake and neither had their biology teacher who was a long for the ride with us. Now I've got a, I've got major goosebumps. They're uh, a rare endangered species up there, and I have story after story and the photos behind it of our experiences with the timber rattlesnakes right where you found it. This yeah. is a very special sacred experience you're having. Oh my word! It was it was extraordinary to be there uh, with a group of young people, and we're we're all you know. Uh, around this um, this beautiful animal, when a five line skink, little blue tailed lizard, comes uh, scampering across the rock, mm -hmm. comes right up alongside it, and comes eyeball to eyeball with this ra timber rattlesnake. I mean, inches apart. And John Wilson, the, the, their teacher, who's been with them. It was a Waldorf school, so they'd actually many of these kids have been in school together for you know since they were in, in grade school, and he'd known them uh, for ten years or so. And he looks over at me because the preface to the book that he'd read that uh, made this him to in, you know contact me and invite me. It the preface described my first encounter with a, a five line skink, um, and so. We're just, he's just kind of looking over and I'm feeling, I didn't do this. Mm -hmm. You did this. Your, your community, whatever you've built here is what invited this moment to happen. And so the rattlesnake then uh, moves off, but the skink stays there. And what I describe in the, um, in the preface to this book um, is reaching down and grabbing the skink and they autonomize, they break their own tail off. And it was taught to me always as this Darwinian uh, escape mechanism, mechanism that the bright, the brightly colored tail would, would uh, shimmer and shimmy and that the predator would get distracted and off would go the skink with, with his life and the predator would just get the tail. Well, the book I wrote was kind of challenging. My, my, it was my, my route from out of a Darwinian perspective to a different way of looking at animals. And, um, so I thought, well, I should probably grab it, grab the skink. So I snatched this. That's one of the good things about growing up on a brook and learning how to catch crayfish and so on. Yep. Is you, you got quick hands, right? Um, and sure enough, the tail comes off and I, I pass it around. All these kids for the first time in their life are holding this turquoise sequin tail squirming around and their, their minds are blown. They're just one magical thing to another. Anyway, uh, the, uh, I, I, I basically uh, brought those kids down, and a couple of weeks later, I went to give the commencement address. They'd had this nice experience with me and everything. But I got this bee in my bonnet. I thought, I want to find the shed skin of that rattlesnake. So the night before I was to give the commencement address, I decided I would go hike up to that place. And as I drove from Vermont mm -hmm. to the New York State line there, uh, it got colder and colder. A cold front was moving in. This was June and it was probably 40 degrees by the time I got there. It was kind of freezing rain. And I, Michael, I walked in, I'd set this intention. I told about five people 
I was going to be the first commencement speaker at a Waldorf High School to bring a live rattlesnake to um, the commencement. But all I wanted was the skin. And so I walked up and I went straight to the spot where we had seen the snake. And there, as if the butler had laid it out, was the, the oh shed skin. God. So I picked this thing up, not surprised. Somehow I knew it was going to be there for me. I bring it over and I put it inside the this little ridge top shelter, which I knew known for, you know, 30 years. And, and I think, okay, now I, I know I, I have a gift to bring to these kids to give them tomorrow. Um, but I need to say something. What am I going to say? And I stood there and I thought it just came into my head in the long run. We find what we expect. We shall be fortunate then if we expect great things. It's real. It is real. It is absolutely real. The intentions of a faithful heart, especially in a place to which one has faithfulness, in community, where what one is asked for is not for oneself, but for others. Absolute, divine, white magic is the result, is the result. And Henry Thoreau's life, I think, is about as good a testament and testimony we have to that. And then by embracing his motto, by embracing his uh, gospel, if you will, we, we keep alive a magic that he, we, we actually dip into a stream of magic. You know, everybody grew up with Harry Potter, right? It's a completely invented it's not an authentic tradition. There's nothing behind it. There is, when you, when you bring your, maybe actually I, I want to stop and say, I actually believe a new magical tradition could grow out of Harry Potter. Right. That syncretistic, yeah. you know, work that appealed to, uh, that there is real magic in the, the faithfulness and the, and the devotion that, that young people bring to that. But this, there is a natural stream of white magic that doesn't, nobody needs to come and whisper in your ear and say, you gotta go give an oath and you know have a certain hand clasp. All you have to do is bring a faithful, open heart to the natural world, compassionate, generous, and playful. Sing and dance, and man, oh man, step back and you just wait to see what happens. It'll, it'll blow your mind. That little story I gave you about the, this skink in the, in, the, in the rattlesnake, which, you know, went on from there. Um, uh, it's, it's those experiences that young people have that just like Henry Thoreau, think of it. At that moment, when that happened to him with the arrowhead, he could have gone a different path. He could have ended up working in the, in the mill dam in the middle of Concord. He could have forgotten about all of his experiences like that. Instead, he kept looking for those experiences and he began to understand why they happened. And he acted in such a way that they would continually enrich his life and enrich the natural world. And uh, every single one of us has that, has that choice and that opportunity. Um, and, and God bless Henry Thoreau for, I feel like he saved my life. I feel like he saved my life, really. Um, and then that I got to find out how he saved my life and you know so many years later as an old man really um that's that's a real blessing that's a real blessing and thank you for your attentiveness forgive me for going on so no long. no no I, I i've had a bottled up woohoo inside of me for this whole thing and, and 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 as an interviewer i wouldn't be worth my weight of salt so the expression goes if i didn't ask how did he save your life I didn't have any models when I was, you know, when you're an adolescent, you're looking to mimic something. You're looking to pattern yourself after somebody. And if I think back to it, yeah, I had my heroes of, you know, people I admired. And, um, but I, I held them close to my heart because I didn't know anybody else like that. I didn't. Um, and I, haven't my life 
you know, isn't isn't the gold. You know, my life is mostly, uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't consciously cultivated that dimension to the degree that I would have loved to. Um, but to the degree that I have done it, it's because I had a, a friend, I had a model, I had somebody whose words rang in my ears mm -hmm. and whose life to me seemed like a shining beacon that uh, that even then um, was a kind of a, a, uh, a homeopathic antidote to the materialistic culture that we that we grew up in um and I, and uh so he's maybe it's too dramatic to say he saved my life but i said it i stick by it yeah excellent thank you so before we start to wind things down I wonder if real briefly you can share the importance of november 16th 1850 and how his life changed from that day forward Michael, God bless you for for that, for asking me that question. Yeah, you you were the one to first identify the the the, the importance of rhythm, and uh, I I had that as a search image uh, that I should look just as he looked for rhythms of when did the lilacs bloom and when did the peepers first mate, and uh, that I should look similarly for those rhythms in his life to see if i could find some patterns uh of phenology if you will mm -hmm. of um of thoreau's life and just you know it's very easy be, because if you have a journal progressively uh through a biography of only 44 years uh you can you don't have to be there <laughs> you've got a record of it it's almost like an almac uh, mm -hmm. or a um, and for a you know well but in my looking for rhythms there was there were lots of breaks in those years uh from when he first opened the journal with the words uh you know i saw i saw mr emerson today and he asked me what i'm doing and asked me if i keep a journal uh to this date in that november of 18 1850, yeah. 1850. It had always been episodic and, and sporadic. And then, boom, on that day, it became daily. And that day, it was the most ecstatic outburst previously and, I think, afterwards. There was never so ecstatic an outburst where I love, I love, I love. My journal should be a record of my love. I love and it. At that moment, you could feel in his expression into his journal, he discovered his life's work. He, he finally hit his stride. Mm -hmm. he, he'd gotten into the zone, you know, and, and boom, how did it show up? It shows up the very next day. It's a daily chronicle from there, there forward. So since I'd been looking for a rhythm, I looked at that date and I thought, well, how old was he? Boom. Two days, three days from 33 and a third years. Now, I already had a kind of sensibility about this because I grew up in the era of LPs. <laughs> 33 and a third was something that was on the tip of our tongue. Mm -hmm. We lived for 33 and a third, right? Um, and, of course, it's the, it's the rhythm of, of Jesus of Nazareth's life. Yeah. And... Uh, I had already known that uh, there was an interesting thing in, in human biographies that many, many people had extraordinary moments then. And I guess I was not, I, w I was just overjoyed to find that this man, whom I believe lived into the rhythms of the cosmos so effectively mm -hmm. that he caught the Christ rhythm. He caught, he caught the Christ rhythm. It came right into him and boom, on a dime. There it was. That's my interpretation that if our destiny, we are called here, each one of us, to do something, to do something really for the world, 
and only we can do it. And if you choose, uh, you know, a path that is is difficult and not the normal path, uh, it will be it will be the narrow way. It will pre prevent it will present obstacles. Uh, the fact that there in that moment, I felt that everything uh, was affirmed for him, uh, for me looking back on his life, that the Christ rhythm had shown up in his life in such a dramatic way. And now what's interesting, Michael, is as a biographer, people can read that. That's why I moved to tears that you would ask me about it, because I probably 99 percent of the people who read the book would would think, oh, here, this Dr. Dan's gone down a strange path here. What's this about? You know, it's a it's numerology. That's what that's what the review in The New York Times called it, numerology. And that's not fair to Henry. Henry practiced. He didn't practice numerology, he practiced observation. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to follow his example. And I feel like um, you're asking me the question is the reward. At least now it's lives. If no one else took note of that or believed it or was moved by it, you have. That's all it takes. Even if one person doesn't read it, the fact is that the universe acknowledges and responds because out of, the, out of the intention of your own efforts, you've made a discovery, you've connected to something with your heart. That's immortal, that's what immortality is. And uh, it's lovely when it's echoed to have you ask me the question. I feel like everything that, that everything I did to bring this book into the world to honor uh, Henry is, is really, really uh, made good by your question thank you you have completely driven me to tears <laughs> didn't mean to no it's all it's all for the good no i mean i'm high-fiving you oh they, no i get it nobody, nobody I've, I've been you know everybody everybody talked to me last year they all you know, all these interviews and everything nobody nobody went there nobody went there god bless you brother for doing that that's that's just fantastic it it goes both ways Woo <laughs> I am so touched. All right. So <laughs> this is this is the question I'm sure that everybody's asked, but I do get to ask it as well because we're a self-help show and I want to help people today. If he were alive today, what advice do you think he would give people? Know your own bone. Gnaw on it and gnaw it still. Know your own bone. We, we are our own greatest mystery. We are our own greatest landscape for discovery. That's why, Michael, you in your life have responded to and cultivated a meditative life, a meditative practice. So know your own bone, gnaw on it, gnaw it still. You have to have a meditative practice. And Henry happened, his whole life was a meditation. He got to, he got to do that. Um, so it's, you know, it's, I, when I was teaching university, I'd look out at my students, all these beautiful kids, I'd say, the world was, was built to distract you. Even, even this university education is built to distract you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to carry you away from yourself. It's not going to carry you into yourself. If you want to know your destiny, if you want to, you have a destiny. That's, I mean, universities don't teach kids they've got a destiny, yeah. right? But that's what it's supposed to do. University, the universe called you into being, and now you owe it to the universe to do that deed for which you are best suited, not to half-ass it or to do what somebody else wanted you to do, or get a lot of money. No, gnaw on it and gnaw on it still, and you will, you will sing your own song, you will dance your own dance, and it will, it will be your greatest work. You are your own greatest work, and you only can do that through silence, through introspection, through long, long 
devotion to things that you love. Mm -hmm. And so there, yeah, it's, uh, and, and, and hang out with the people who, who you can smell and, and taste, know that even if they couldn't put it into words, they're already doing it. They're living it and they're around, they're around. Woohoo! What advice would you give parents to help their kids in this world of distractibility where it is so hard. I mean, we have Richard Louv, Last Child in the Woods, where it is so hard to find our land today. What would you tell them? Uh, this is a... I've got a book proposal out there that I, I'm i trying, you know, I hope will give me an opportunity to, to tell mm -hmm. the world or at least tell North America Americans, um, um, look, every kid has already fallen in love with some, some creature, mm. some, some creature. And, uh, it, some other, maybe, maybe it's not, um, a red tailed hawk or a peregrine falcon or, you know, but as best as possible, um, Give your children as many opportunities as they have for for freely exploring their own innate love of the creatureliness of the planet and uh, and seek seek for them uh, opportunities where they can be in silence in nature too, not the blabbing. Uh, nature center and stuff, but if if you can put them, they'll find it. If you if you if you get out to places uh, where there's silence, um, they'll they'll leave your skirt strings enough to to find the silence and find the mystery and cultivate that. Uh, and I say that you know, not having raised a kid in the age of of uh, of the internet really so maybe i'm maybe i'm crazy maybe i need to be taught schooled myself about that we need we need a much more proactive uh way to hold on to this thread i don't know i i, I look forward actually to that conversation it's part of the the fact that you asked the question I, I have to start paying more attention to to what others are doing thank you Thank you. So, so now on a much lighter note, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? My bicycle. What you got? <laughs> what you riding these days? Well, actually, uh, I used to always say, since I like to vagabond, you know, I used to always say that the only thing I needed when I come into any town, anywhere in the world would be a a bicycle mm -hmm. and a guitar, uh, and yeah, if, if it came down to it, I would say a guitar or a mandolin, um, just because the the bicycle's for my own pleasure, mm -hmm. whereas the the guitar is something that you can bring pleasure to a whole village. And uh, what's the instrument that you said? There's a Mitch Horowitz story. Oh yeah. Um, when I first moved to Brooklyn seven years ago, uh, I went on a long walk with my daughter. And uh, on that walk, I had told her about the night before how I had uh, heard this guy at Jalopy, a, a Red Hook Club, play a dobro um, as, a, as a rhythm instrument and the lead singer in this band. And that I had found three picks in the week leading up to hearing these guys. And each time I picked up the pick from the, from the ground, uh, something had, I'd had an innate sense that something was coming. And then when the third one came, I knew it was imminent that something was coming to me. And just a few hour, you know, uh, midnight the night before, uh, uh, hearing this dobro in the morning, I woke up, I just kept saying, I'm going to get a dobro. I'm going to get a dobro. And I went on this long walk with my daughter, and I told her this as well. And we're about three blocks from her house. And as we're walking along, there was a bunch of guys on a stoop and then trash on the on the sidewalk. 
uh, wicker furniture and boxes of books and things. And there was this old beat up guitar case. So as we passed it, I just rocked it. It was a hard shell, but all the all the cover was peeling off of it and everything. And the the the, uh, the hardware was rusty on it. And I just figured somebody was throwing out, out an old case. And I, I said to these guys, does this belong to you? And they said, no, no, um, some fella just brought it down a second ago. I opened it up and I was looking at a brand new Dobro. The exact guitar that I'd seen played the night before that I wanted, right? Shiny steel resonator pan. I closed it and my daughter's, her, you know, her jaw had dropped. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, you know, could you ask him? And the guy who lived there ran upstairs and he came back a second later. He said, yeah, he says it's yours if you want it. Now, I I told a bunch of people for a week I'd said something's coming, something's coming, mm -hmm. and particularly one person had been with me for the three. One, the first one was a mandolin pick on the Lower East Side, a dog, David Grisman pick. It's the specificity. That's the thing about Thoreau. It's very specific. These these magical gifts that come from the universe are meant just for you. They're not for anybody else. Nobody else could understand them. They wouldn't even see them as gifts. They'd th see it as a as a drag. Nobody nobody else wanted that Dobro. I wanted. I, I wanted it with all my heart and soul. I went into the night and the first thing I talked about in the morning was that. What a capricious gift. What a capricious gift. And the instant it was given to me, I knew what I needed to do was write a song about it. And then I needed to share the story. So every time I got together with musicians, I would tell a story. And then it, years later, I was still thinking about it. And I thought, I still don't understand it. And this is at the moment when I'm then... I read Thoreau's story. And I think that's, his arrowhead is my dobro. It's the same thing. And I, I gotta know, I gotta know, how does that happen? How does that happen? And I don't believe synchronicity, that's a black box. It doesn't have any explanatory power. Like Thoreau, I wanna be a good empirical naturalist. I wanna, I wanna know, you know, how did this happen? And, and it happened enough times, like with the, with the snake and the skink and everything. It happened many, many times in my life, and I thought, now, now I got I feel, an, I feel an, a, a responsibility that I have to investigate this, introspect it, and then I have to tell a compelling story about it. So I wrote a little book called "How Things Find Us," and the subtitle was um, uh, "Heaven's Heaven's Inexhaustible Purse," like Beautiful. the Fortunatus tale, who you know the guy who has the inexhaustible purse, you know, in the magic hat. Mm -hmm. Because that's what Thoreau had become to me. He be, he loved Fortunatus in the chapbook tales, and he became Fortunatus. And all my life, I've kind of had a little Fortunatus thing going on. Um, so I wrote this little book and and sent it to Mitch, and Mitch loved it. And when I went to meet him to talk about uh, about it, he said, "Well, they've got these stories about Henry Thoreau. What? How do you you know what's your story with Thoreau?" I said, "Well, I actually wrote a biography of him, but because it." said that he believed that he saw fairies uh, they didn't want to publish it and he said well let me see it <laughs> so i sent it to him the next day and that's when uh, thanks so much to mitch horowitz for seeing the truth in the book and the truth in, in thoreau's life to and then hearing and i think the fact is that story of the dobro sealed the deal in a way it's just what mitch it's the gospel that Mitch spreads, oh, yeah. right? That he's out there celebrating, and that you know, out of the blue, we you know, we didn't know each other, and that I, that it was we were we were made for each other that way, as as Henry and I were made for each other, and as the Dobro was made for me, as the Arrowhead was made for Henry, and as as I get to know you, Michael, and yeah. listen to you in the future, I'll get to know what's made for you, you know, your kayak, your shoreline your rhythms, uh, and all of your listeners too. Woohoo! This has been awesome, Kevin. This has been just truly amazing. So I, 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 where can people go to find your book, expect great things and find how things find us and where can they go to find out more? So, uh, the paperback of, uh, expect great things just came out. Uh, and, and so it should be in the bookstores now. Uh, and yeah, it's expect great things is 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 out there. Um, 
it'd be lovely for it to have a second life. You know, it had its first life in, in hardcover. Uh, I, I would love, I would love to enter into another conversation about that book. And maybe thanks to this interview, um, um, how things find us, mm -hmm. which, uh, it, it, it's, it's in abeyance. Uh, I, it's, my agent needs to go out and sell it. I'm going to, I'm going to tell her that, um, I have one reader and his, his listeners, uh, waiting for the book because it's a story that I, I feel bound and determined if Henry had to keep secret mm -hmm. because of the conditions of his time, that when he talked about, uh, the respectable folks, um, I feel called to speak about the respectable folks in an explicit and exoteric way rather than an intimate and esoteric way. We, we now, uh, we now have drowned them out. We have shut them out. And I think a lot of what, what the earth is, is dealing us mm -hmm. with, uh, with extreme kind of violent episodes is the earth speaking to us saying, oh, yeah. you've got to, you've got to put us back in, into your heart. Um, and, and so, uh, how things find us is, is the corrective to the secret. And I, I have, I'm writing a book on evolution right now and I've got two other books here. And so I, and I, I lose interest in what I did a while ago, but I promise you tomorrow I'm contacting my agent and I'm going to say, you know what, how things find us needs to, to come back out because the story still inspires people, and I want to share it with people. So thank you, Michael, for, for asking that. Thank you, Kevin. It needs to be heard. It absolutely needs to be heard. And you, you tell them that I've already booked you for a future date. I call it the future <laughs> presence. It's already booked here and now for Sweet. when that book comes out. Sweet. Wonderful. So do you have a URL you want to send people to? Oh, um, just drdan.com, D-R-D-A-N-N.com is my website. Fantastic. And if you didn't catch Dr. Dan, D-A-N-N.com, come on over to Inspire Nation Show and we'll get you over to Dr. Dan, D-A-N-N.com. Any last words of wisdom before maybe we do a really brief meditation? We've run long, but this has been really, really special. I, I, I don't have a big enough word. All I know is, like, like Henry David Thoreau, I say love, 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 love all the time. And, and, and I love you, man. And I love this interview. This has been so incredibly special. I, I let your words ring into the silence. So to end, I'd love to do with your listeners what I used to do when I'd meet my, my college history classes. Uh, the first day I'd meet them, turn off all the lights, ask them to close their eyes. Mm -hmm. I'd pass out a sheet of paper, have them take out their pencils. And I'd say, let's go back to when you were seven years old. Find yourself in your room at age seven. And look about your room, dress your drawers, look out your window, look at your favorite toys. They're strewn about, things are on the wall. Now look out the window and look down into whatever you had as a, a yard, a backyard, whatever that might be. And now take yourself down into the middle of that yard and place yourself on the earth, feel your tailbone against the earth and smell the grass or the pavement or whatever it is right there. And listen, listen to whatever the sounds are there in that place where you were seven years old at moment. And look out about as far as you can reach What's there? Just as far as you can reach. And then what if you were to stand and walk a couple of steps away from there 
and then another couple of steps from there. Now draw me a map of your world at age seven, with you at the center. What was there just within reach? What could you reach out and touch or hear or smell? And then what was just a few paces away from you? What did you love that you kept close to you, even if it wasn't right at hand within reach? What did you love? What did you keep close? Not just there in your backyard and in your room, in your bed at night when you went to sleep. What did you keep close and what kept you close? And make me a map of that. And for your listeners that are out there, if they, if they do that, share it with a friend, show your child, show your mother and father. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. This has been so... I, no words, Kevin. No words. On the mic, but... It's... Hear us, hear Holt. Lies poor Tom Bowling, the darling of our crew. No more he'll hear the tempest howling, for death has broached him through. His form was of the manliest beauty. His heart was kind and Soft, faithful below, Tom did his duty, and now he's gone aloft, and now he's gone aloft. Enough. Woohoo! Henry's favorite song. <laughs> So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler completely blown away saying be well, have fun, get expect great things, reconnect with your inner nature and your land today and shine bright. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so, so much, Kevin. You're incredibly good at what you do. That I never felt so uh, deeply, deeply understood. And through that, Henry so deeply understood. This is far and away been the, the nicest experience I've had with the interviewer, so thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're gonna get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>